So this week's episode touches on the topic of politics, which I generally try to stay away from. Um, it's kind of hard be based on what we do. We talk a lot about taxes, a lot about accounting, a lot about numbers, and politics are always going to come in, right? Who is setting the tax code? Who is making these rules? And a lot of this comes down to who's in power, who wins the election. So the biggest thing that I wanted to put out there about this episode is no, this is not meant to be kind of a script or an endorsement of either party on here. And I think if you look, there's a lot of commonality here and there is some two stark differences. Now, when we kind of go down through and when we look at this stuff, a lot of these differences are generally not the most surprising thing. Um, I talk about in the episode, and I don't think it's an earth shattering statement, is that a lot of the Democratic plans generally are looking at increasing tax revenue, which generally the only way to do that is increase the actual rates to pay for generally some more programs or just a larger government spending. Now, while the you know classically conservative Republican side you know is usually looking for some sort of tax breaks, um, a lot of times, and this is no different, generally more on the commercial uh, sector of things to stimulate economy, stimulate growth growth and domestic production. Um, but then the same flip side is if you don't have as much tax revenue coming in, what are you going to cut? So all this is really relevant. All of this is what I feel is every American should know. Um, I think kind of the ultimate objective, what I hope people to get out of this is to be more informed. Um, a lot of what we hear and what we're going to kind of talk about on this is truly talking points, right? None of this stuff, you know, most of this stuff I'll actually go out far enough and say will probably never happen. I don't expect most of these plans to be enacted anytime quickly and probably none of them at all in, in the case of some of these more egregious ones. But nonetheless, it's stuff that I think should be weighed or should go into people's mind. And ultimately, you should know as an American, you're voting for this stuff. Is this stuff going to affect me? And is it really going to happen? The tipping point of making me do this episode is, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, two and a half years. This is a, the first presidential um, election that we've had doing this podcast. So it's never really came up as an opportunity before. Um, another reason is, is I've had you guys ask for this, right? I've had a number of people reach out to me privately and say, um, you know, at the debate, Harris came up and said that she was going to expand the $50,000 tax break, you know, to anyone starting a small business. And I saw the gears turning, right? Even myself was thinking, well, if you were going to give me a tax break for going out to start a business, I might be the most entrepreneurial person overnight if you're going to fund the first 50000 Now, as you think about it more, do we really want to stimulate or we really want to incentivize people to go off and start a small business? Think about that. Even if there was at surface value, you know, what they're trying to say is we're going to give you 50000 to start a small business. Do you think that I could get people in trouble if, yeah, that first 50000 that they lost was not their money, but do you think that they have leases that they've personally committed to, um, things that could have lasting effects? Now, on the other side of it, you know, Trump is not immune from, you know, outlandish remarks. I don't think anyone would argue that. Um, some of his tax comments or some of his proposals are a little bit less um, of note because we've seen it before. Um, back in 2017 was the only time during my career of doing this. And really for a lot of people, the last time we had a major tax law overhaul, and that was obviously under Trump's administration. And a lot of those cuts or a lot of those changes are still what we see today. From the aspect of what Trump's proposal is, and, and we'll get onto maybe some of the farther reaching ones, but a lot of those is to make permanent some of the things that you might not even know are temporary today. Um, also expand on some of the things that they had tried to do before, but were weren't able to get done or you know have been undone in the last three or so years. Let's get into... The most popular one. This one I've seen has really drummed up the most interest on this and I think is probably the most misleading if you look at on the surface what it says versus what it actually is. And that's the $50,000 uh, small business break. So I actually went back and I listened and I and I saw the comment and, and she's actually talked about this before. Publicly, I don't think that there's ever been her explaining what this is. It's just been a mention of 50,000 or going from 5,000 to 50,000. Really, it took me kind of looking at this a couple of different ways to even figure out where this was going until she made the comment about 5,000 and now it's going to be 50,000. When the comment came out there about, well, there is something right now we're going to expand it. That immediately to me kind of threw up some flags of, wait. 
There is no sort of program out there right now that currently just gives $5,000 to Americans that want to start a small business. If they're referring to something, it's expanding existing program. So when I kind of did some more research, and she actually does have um, a plan that's put together. I'm not sure if it's official. Um, I'm not sure if this was kind of a comment made at a, you know, that was at a debate that's also been said at rallies that they just kind of run with, or if this is truly part of the plan. But what it is, is this. So currently, let's say that I start a business right now. It doesn't matter what it is, but I am pre-revenue, right? It's all just an idea in my head. It's going to be renewable energy for creating dog food, right? Who knows? But it can be anything. There is no limitations on how good or bad this idea is right now. So let's say this company that I started go out and, you know, has a lot of expenses to get up and running, whether it's legal fees, whether I have to pay an accountant, whether I need to go look at different products, whatever it is, I'm going to have expenses before I have revenue. 99.99% of the time, any business starts this way. Now, the way that the tax law is currently written is if I spent $50,000 on what the IRS now classifies as startup expenses, I am only allowed to deduct $5,000 of those expenses. So think about that. If I went out and I started this company this year and I spent $50,000 of my own money, but pre-revenue, then the IRS could deem that as startup expenses. And if those are deemed startup expenses, I can only deduct 5,000 in the first year. And then the remainder has to be amortized, which means that I take that remaining amount of 45,000, divide it by 15, and I'm gonna get a $3,000 deduction every year for the next 15 years. That is the way that the current law is written. So the comment that was made about expanding this to $50,000 is what they're saying is that instead of the maximum amount of startup expenses at $5,000, they are going to expand that to $50,000. It does not mean that they're going to give you any money. It does not mean they're going to give you more money for starting a business. They are going to let you deduct more than what they currently do now of expenses that you've already incurred. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, Hunt, that doesn't really seem like they're giving us a whole lot of anything because I feel like we should already be able to deduct these expenses right now, right? So I'll give you the idea behind this. And I think that my thoughts on this have probably are a bit conflicted because in theory, it does make sense, right? So like I said before, the business that I want to start up could be anything. It could be the world's dumbest business, but who is out there to say, Hunt, that's a dumb business. It's not going to make any sense. But if I went out and I said, I'm going to you know, make this company that makes renewable energy for dog food or something that's silly that has no economic viability to it, I could go and I could have a bunch of expenses. I could deduct those expenses and I would get a tax break for it. So the idea behind a startup expense is, is saying, hey, until you get some revenue, until you get some money flowing in here, we don't want you deducting all of this stuff and getting a tax break. So that all makes sense. Why this is just a bit silly and this comment was just off the cuff and it will affect no one. And I mean, probably no one, but I'm going to say no one is you guys are already deducting this stuff. I only have seen a handful of times in my career, anyone that has ever amortized startup expenses, most accounts out there deducting this stuff whenever it was incurred. Um, yeah. And it's just not something again, that is really often used and, you know, that should be pretty clear by the fact that we have to do a podcast of what the heck is startup expenses. So I like it in theory, right? Hey, you know, anyone that's going to give a break to small businesses is always good. But just like I think a lot of times, you know, of what we've all experienced as small business owners, a lot of times there's a lot of talk. We want to help out small businesses. Yet when push comes to shove, the ultimate tax code seems to really kind of be zeroing in on small businesses, even though we're the ones that we're supposed to be saved. So on the Trump side of things, you know, we have a number of other, you know, items that are going to go down through. And, and before I kind of go into one of the um, Trump proposals I want to highlight, I need to highlight something that both of these parties agree on. So one of the things, and I agree with this a lot, is both the Harris campaign and the Trump campaign both feel that tips should not be taxable. The way it is right now, and it's a bit convoluted on it, but if you go into a restaurant and you give that employee a tip on your credit card, that gets reported and more or less that gets taxed, just like that payroll that they're getting from the owner of that restaurant. It's also even a little bit more complicated because now the owner of that restaurant is somewhat responsible for paying the payroll taxes on this. And it's a big thing, right? You know, a tip is supposed to be a show of appreciation, a gift, whatever you want to say. I mean, some places it's no longer a gift. It's almost mandatory. The 
theory behind a tip is, hey, a show of appreciation. So this proposal on both sides, I think, has merit from, you know, a sense purpose of, hey, you know what? Are we really going to be taxing someone which is a show of appreciation for their services, right? You're not taxing that tip that you get to, you know, a valet person. You're not taxing tips other places because those are cash. And the reason of why this is a very smart proposal for both of these guys is, you know, if you're looking at tip income, that is a very strong selling point in the service industry, which is a large population of voters. So essentially what you're going back to the service industry employee, you know, come November is, hey, a large portion of your income could become non-taxable. That's going to be a big selling point for a lot of people. The fact that they both agree upon this means that it's kind of a, you know, bipartisan issue. Hey, seems like Republicans and Democrats are both on board with this. But the thing that makes me a little bit skeptical is, hey, if both of these candidates say that they're going to do it, to a certain extent, you know, one of them is already in power and, you know, Trump has enough power in Congress right now that if you guys both agree on this, well, then just make tip income not taxable right now. I don't think the tip income will become untaxed because, again, that opens up a whole nother can of worms, right? You guys would stop paying your employees and wages and just tip them because you could save them money. So there's so many loopholes on there. Um, you know, again, to go back to in theory, you know, and talk about what it, it's really trying to do, I get it. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was a delivery driver. All of my tips were in cash. According to the IRS, I probably didn't make a whole lot of tip money in any of those years because just like a lot of people before credit cards were super common, all the tips were in cash and they seldom got reported. Uh, flash forward today, 99% of tips are in credit cards. So all this stuff is getting reported, hence getting taxed. How big are we talking about? Uh, when I did some research from this episode, the tip pool industry, like the revenue created from tips last year was like $35 billion. So massive, massive amounts of money here. I would say, you know, probably not the most aggressive comment. I would say the most aggressive or far reaching comment that Trump's side has made is when he was in office um, back in his first term, the increased tariffs that they had on China are still here today. So some of this stuff, you know, is legacy continuing on. But just like he talked about in other things, their idea for tariffs would not only keep those in place, but expand them and even possibly to a point where it would even eliminate income taxes. This is something that, you know, if you've been to Europe, you're somewhat familiar with. It's called the VAT tax, value added tax. Um, in a larger sense, what it would be is a tax on consumption, not a tax on income. So so if all the stuff that we buy and everything had tariffs on it and people were paying the tariffs, then essentially, yeah, you are going to be paying, you know, 20%, 30%, whatever on the things that you buy. Now, the thing that's popular about, you know, a consumption tax is if you're a net saver, meaning, hey, I make more money than I spend. I like to save money. I like to invest. You generally get rewarded in these scenarios versus if you're a net consumer, meaning you're borrowing money, you know, uh, spending more than you make, you're going to end up actually paying more. So you can kind of see, depending on what side and probably what tax bracket you're in, you know, consumption tax could work better or worse, you know, for either side of this. The big one on the Trump side, and again, you can, you can hear this undertone. I mean, anyone that should be looking at this that thinks any of these proposals have financial merit, have merit in balancing the budget, have merit in actually being viable options, you're missing the point of this, right? Neither of what we've gone through on either party is earth-shattering stuff that has not been said before, has not been promised before, but yet all of the stuff we're talking about has never actually been done. So if it's never been done before, but it's been talked about promised before, does that mean that I would have any expectation of this stuff happening? No, right? But we want to talk about it. We want to get educated because even though most of this will not, some of this absolutely will come to fruition. So Trump's thing that he came out and promised, that I believe this was at a rally um, or I don't think that it was at the debate, but it could have been a debate. Uh, forgive me. I did not watch the entire thing. Um, but what he talked about was to make overtime non-taxable. Again, 
If you talk about making overtime not taxable, you are talking to an entire base of the population. A lot of that is going to overlap with the service industry that we talked about before, but kind of two completely different sectors. Um, the service tip industry is going to be bartenders, um, you know, servers, things like that, where your base pay could be three, four dollars, right? You're making all of your money off of tips. Um, versus a different type of service or blue collar industry, which is more common in the overtime, that is a large group of people that have a wage pool much, much, much larger than the tip income. So the idea behind this or what Trump's dialogue behind this is that the blue collar employees of America are the backbone, right? The overtime hours, the manual labor, you know, that is what we should be rewarding in our country. And, you know, the key to a better future is to reward these people to work more, to, you know, build, to invent, to whatever, um, instead of penalizing them by taxing them. Um, there was also a comment on there and. I'm not sure this is from him or someone else said it, that overtime is currently now taxed at a higher rate than base pay. So we kind of have two comments or two topics that we want to talk about there. So the first is, let's talk about that, right? Overtime being untaxed. This one, I don't really think that we spend any time on this because it just won't happen, right? Like right now, you guys have an incentive to do the opposite, right? If you have someone working 2,100 hours a year and full-time is 2,000, you do not want that person to be working overtime because you're going to have to pay them time and a half, depending on the state that you're in. You could give them different benefits, breaks, et cetera. Everyone right now is kind of arguing, no, you are not working overtime. You are not subject to overtime. What it would look like going forward is the exact opposite. The average employee in America on paper would probably go from working 2,000 hours a year to working 2,500. Because if I could end up making the same amount, if my boss just said I worked more hours at a lower rate, why wouldn't I do that? And, you know, if I worked, you know, every five hours was an hour of overtime, I'm only going to be paying tax on 80% of my wages. So even though it, makes somewhat of sense. We're not quote unquote penalizing people for working more. It's also doesn't make a whole lot of sense because whether it's 2000 hours or an hour or two after that, or an hour or two after that 40 hour work week, it's still getting taxed at the same rate. It looks like it's a higher rate for really two main reasons. So the first that it looks like it's a higher rate is maybe people that don't understand what rate is, right? Rate is generally usually a percentage. And if you are making more in your hourly rate, then the taxes withheld are going to be higher, right? That is just basic. And if you look at a, a paycheck that has overtime and a paycheck that doesn't, of course, you're going to have more Social Security, Medicare, and withholding on your overtime check, right? No one should be surprised on that. Now, the second reason on this of why overtime is somewhat taxed at a truly higher rate, meaning it's going to be a higher percentage than your other uh wages or your other paychecks is has to do with marginal tax brackets. What I mean by that is let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Your top tax bracket is 24%, but there's 10% rates in there. There's 12% rates in there. There's 22% and then you get to 24%. So the way that the withholding works is throughout the year, it's going to kind of smooth out those percentages. And so even though some of these are going to be taxed in different buckets, smooth out, it's going to look like 16% of your wages are going to taxes. Now, if they're not expecting you to make any overtime, when you make an overtime dollar, this is additional income that was not factored in. So yeah, you could see that overtime get taxed at 24%. So from an outsider looking at it, well, that overtime is being taxed at a higher rate, when in actuality, it's all being taxed at a higher rate, it might be withheld slightly higher to make sure that you don't have a balance due. Again, kind of like the small business write-off, the expanding of the startup expenses, right? The overtime is no different, right? It makes sense. I can get it. The difference in the two is, you know, the startup expense or startup credit, if there was to be expanded, I don't think it would actually have any impact in real life. Um, on the opposite side of it, if Trump was to truly be able to make overtime not taxable, for a lot of people, this could really help out a lot. Now, that being said, I'd be extremely surprised if it was put in like that without maximums, without limitations, because I'm already thinking to myself, there's areas to abuse this, and I would be looking on how my clients could leverage this. And I think that that is really the overall end conclusion we should have, right? You know, look at these issues, you know, vote on these issues in November with who you agree with. But ultimately, the big thing to take out of this is it's too early to tell. But 
what we see here is opportunity for changes. And generally, any time that we have changes in the tax code, especially in the first year or two, there's usually going to be savings opportunities for those that look for them. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope this is something that you found useful. If you share this with your friends, share the podcast with friends, I would appreciate it. Um, As always, if you have any questions or you want to see something else on a future episode, shoot me an email at podcast at parmelis.com and would love to get into it. So just want to say thanks again for joining us and we'll talk to you guys soon.